Good evening and welcome to another edition of How to Rock the Stage. I'm your host, The Trigger, Rich Bond Trigger. Welcome back for a night where it's all about you, your media persona, helping you to shine on camera, shine on stage. That's what this show is all about. Why do we want you to shine on camera and stage? We want you to amplify and grow you and your brand authority on any platform, whatever business you are in now, you are on stage. It's all about showing up well with your Zoom, with your Google Meets, whatever it is you use, even those business meetings are very important to show up. But it's also about how you show up and what you do. And tonight we're gonna have a special, special conversation. I'm really excited about voice over acting and the voice control, the voice amplification. How best do you learn to use your voice professionally to engage people, tantalize people, keep them excited. We're gonna have a great conversation about voice acting tonight. So stick around for that. Coming up next week, Stuart Master is going to be with us. We're going to have a special 1 o'clock daytime episode next week, November the 9th on Wednesday. And it's going to be about the strategic narrative. This week, it's about the voice. And the next week on Wednesday, we're going to talk about the strategic narrative. So these two could blend together very well. And he's from Europe. We're going to go over the big pond and have a great conversation live in the middle of the day. So join us at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And then coming up on November the 16th, Carlton Brunton will be with us. We're going to go back over the pond again. He's going to stay up late with us. We're going to have a great time. We're going to talk about video content and the recession, how to recession-proof your content. The fear of the recession is growing and mounting. He's going to help us with that coming up in two weeks. And we'd like to thank our sponsor, the National Speakers Association, for helping to bring Rock the Stage now to the National Speakers Association. And we'd love to have part of the NSA with us. And it's great to be launching their new show monthly right now called NSA Behind the Stage. Tonight, it's all about voice acting and voice acting come to life. Richard Crossman is our guest tonight. He's a voiceover actor. He's had the opportunity to work in many different styles, animation, documentary, medical uh, voiceover work, e-learning, audiobooks, and corporate narration. Each one requires different approaches, dialects and voices, and he masters all of it. Richards has been uh, narrated nonfiction audiobooks, the ear learning modules, corporate explainers, documentaries, and animated characters for the web series as well. By the way, he does over 20 accents, 20 different dialects, including Canadian, American, British, English, French, Italian, German, Irish, and Scottish, which I'm sure I butchered. And Richard is also getting ready for another season again of being Santa and putting on the big red suit. Welcome to the stage tonight, Richard Crossman. Great to see you tonight, Santa. It's great to be here. Ho, 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 ho. I hope you're all being good. I did ask him backstage if I'm on the naughty or nice list. And what was your response, Richard? We'll see how tonight goes. <laughs> We're in for a great night of fun, and I'm imagining some voices may appear a little bit. So I've had a love and affinity. I was telling you that backstage. I can remember when Rich Little used to come on Johnny Carson. Yes, that dates me. But Rich Little could do multiple voices, one conversation. He was a genius. What got you hooked on voice acting? Mel Blanc and Looney Tunes cartoons. That was the other choice. <laughs> what was your favorite voice from Mel Blanc? Oh, there were so many, uh, Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck and uh, it'll Foghorn Leghorn. It just went on and on and on and on. And I didn't have any idea what it was at the time. I just fell in love with the voices. And it wasn't until decades later, I realized what was happening and how it was being done. Interesting. People do not realize Mel Blanc did the majority of Warner Brothers voices on all those early Saturday cartoons, the vast majority. Yeah, he had something like 300 voices in his repertoire. When when you do these voices, talk us a little bit here early on about do you create the voice in your head, the dialogue, the narrative? Do you take a script and then build off of it? Which does it work? Does it work from you or does it work for, from the production sheet? Well, it can work from either direction, actually. It doesn't really matter in my case because I can do both ways. Um, I'm actually a trained opera singer. So I was trained to sing in six languages in classical music. And... Um, so I have a lot of the accents and dialects naturally. I'm a trained chef. I worked in um, classical French kitchens. So I have the French, I have the German, I have the Italian, uh, I have Latin, I have English. Um, so if I want to create a character from a script, for instance, 
Um, if perhaps I was going to give you a demonstration on how to make the French pastry, I can give you the French pastry chef, you know. Uh, it's very easy for me because I, I worked with those people and I also sing in French, so it's not a problem. Um, and I have English heritage. I have uh, English and Welsh grandparents. The Welsh I haven't gotten down yet. It's, it's a little tricky, but I have a great Scots accent because of my great grandfather. And I can just pop that one on any time I want to. That's and one my of my favorite, favorite I love of, that accent. One of my favorite characters that I developed is Lord Hamish McIntyre, the greatest haggis hunter of all of Scottish, Scottish history. <laughs> I told you, we're going to be in for a fun night, everybody. So strap it on. You're in for a great run. Don't forget the Q&A box is always open. Chat box should be working this week, but we're going to have a great time. And the second half of the show, you got to ask Richard your own questions. What was your favorite voice growing up? Was there any one that you particularly gravitated to that really you practiced, you worked through? You know, I did Batman and Robin growing up, and my family said, that's enough now. <laughs> well, it, it's funny you should ask that because uh, we have photographs of me at the age of seven in a Santa suit, handing out Christmas gifts on Christmas morning. So Santa Claus was my original character. Wow. Wow. And I've been and now, playing him ever since. Yeah, I was going to say, now you've been doing this ever since. And as we were talking backstage, you also said you're literally prepping. The beard is now coming even fuller. So besides the character voice, you also blend in the persona of your character, don't you? Oh, yes, you have to. Um, and... In actual fact, Santa Claus with me goes back even further than that, because at the age of three, I recited the entire poem Twas the Night Before Christmas in a Christmas show. And it just sort of went from there, three years old. Um, and my mother was there and I was chatting with her about it a few weeks ago. And she said, "You, I sat in the front row waiting in case you needed me. But she said, you didn't even look at me. You just recited the whole thing and away it went. So Santa's in the blood. And you're from Canada, so. I am from Canada, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> we moved the North Pole a little south right now for, to where I'm living, but that's that's okay. <laughs> when it comes to dialects and voices, like mm -hmm. I used to love doing the Batmans, the Robin, the Saturday morning stuff. And I actually felt I, I was pretty good at the time. But what is it about the voice? Some people have that dialect ability to change it up, to do it. They, they, they can do the R's and the L's and the things. Is there something that's going to genetically also bred in the voice actors? Uh, according to a number of medical studies, research studies, uh, those people who have an affinity for music usually have an affinity for languages and vice versa. So there is something genetic in our makeup. Um, there are also those who simply cannot learn to roll the R's in Scottish and other dialects, and that too is genetic. It's the way the tongue works. So there, there, there are some genetic factors, but it also takes a lot of practice in most cases. That's something I'm sure we're gonna dive into more. We're gonna launch our poll question tonight. I'm really excited about this. And tonight you get more than one selection. We're gonna give you multiple options tonight on our poll question tonight. Cool. And this is gonna be about animated characters. I have a list here of which one of these characters is your favorite. You, the viewing audience tonight, Castro Bolt here with this list, and we kind of cherry picked it, but it's gonna be Speedy Gonzalez, Shaggy from Scooby-Doo, Zoink Scoob, um, and we also have Marvin the Martian, we have Tommy from the Rugrats, we have Elmer Fudd, we have uh, Kenny from South Park, and then we also have Beavis and Budhead. I'm trying to cover the many generations here. We're gonna let that roll, Castro Bolt, so we keep going on with our conversation with Richard and Richard, tell us more about that whole dialect and the training side. How long did it take you to really accomplish and be really accomplished that one voice you said? Uh, well, with dialects and accents, you have to have uh, an, an ear and you have to be able to pick up the nuances. Um, a dialect or an accent, and they're often used interchangeably. There, there are some slight nuance differences, but... Um, in different areas of the world, we speak from different areas of the mouth and the throat and the head and the chest. 
And if you're speaking in, in North American, Canadian American English, we generally work about halfway back in the middle of the, what the, the hard palate in, in the mouth. So it's sort of in the middle. Um, if you are speaking German, it tends to drop back a little bit more into the throat. Um, it tends to be um, more, um, if you like the beer and the bratwurst, it's riding down here more in the throat. If you are speaking the French, it is often much more up in front of the teeth or near the teeth, um, and other accents uh, rise more into the head. Some rise, uh, drop down into the chest a little bit. Um, so it, yeah, there's there's the voice placement is a great deal to, or has a great deal to do with dialects and accents, and then you have to be able to hear the differences in vowels and consonants. And once you've got all of that, you have to make sure that you're getting the syntax right. It's kind of uh, the easiest way to, to explain that is using Yoda as an example. Yoda inverts a lot of sentences. Yeah. <laughs> there is no try, only do or do not. <laughs> Master does. Master does. Yes. Yes. He, and again, that's part of the character development. Yes. Uh, so Frank Oz did the voice, a, mm -hmm. again, a wizard again with the voices and oh, yeah. everything else. But he took the voice and they, the, which came first, do you think, the puppet or the voice? I, I don't know. I've, I've never gone into that at all. Um, but with Frank Oz, I mean, he is such a genius and created so many characters over the years. But the syntax, again, I'm not even sure whether that was him or whether that was the script. And it, it could have been either one. Um, a prime example of that sort of thing is Robin Williams playing the genie in the animated Aladdin. Um, they wrote him a bare bones script and he improvised 90% of it. Yes. So and they said they just rolled tape and he changed voices. In yep. the exact same scene, he would go cut, keep rolling, and he would just change the voice. And they had yep. multiple voices for one scene. Yep, yeah, it was it was incredible. Um, a, a phenomenal voice actor, phenomenal actor. Period. Um, but he was just so attuned to improvisation and the craziness of animation that he just let loose, and they just recorded and then clipped what they needed. I got a question from a fellow Canadian. Schroeder is dropping into the Q&A here. He wants to know about that whole thing about the singing voice, the speaking voice, the competent voice. Is there anything that you do to help get that loosened up to get that going with the singing voice? He's really curious. He well, coaches himself. Um, I I use the same warm ups for my voiceover, for my uh, for my stage and film acting, and for my singing. Um, I've, as I say, I've been singing since I was like four years old. I started singing professionally at age 10 um, and I had opera training. So I use a lot of opera vocalises, just vowels and scales to warm up the voice. And I place them in different parts of the mouth, like we do with the different accents. I'll place it in front behind the teeth. I'll place it part way back. I'll play, place it further in the throat. I'll bring it up into the head. I'll drop it down into the chest. Um, depending on what characters I'm doing, I'll, I'll focus a little more on that, but I run the whole gamut so that I'm ready to go when I actually get into the studio or on stage. So this kind of goes a little bit to Vivian's question. I know Vivian, she's a, a, a great author, speaker. Uh, she's been in news journalism like I have, but she also wants to know about that, that shift from, let me get it right here. I would love to do different character voices. She says she's going to get going at it. News people are told to keep kind of monotone, flat, the average American flatlander voice. But now when you talk about that shift to the, the other animated voices, you got to get out of that plain, ordinary voice, don't you? What would you recommend for somebody to make that shift out of the average voice to the more animated voice? The best way to do it is play. Um, use your voice. Find out what your voice is capable of doing. Are you able to go way down here in the bottom of the throat? And I'm a tenor, so this is way down here for me. 
On the other hand, if you want it and you go way up in the head and in the head voice and you've got a facetto, you know, you can do stuff like that and sound like kids. I mean, it's just that much fun. But whatever you do, you have to be careful that you don't overdo it. You can feel strain in your throat and in your vocal cords. And if you feel that, stop, because that's going to create medical issues down the road. And uh, one of the things that uh, we are told as voice actors when we're creating animated characters is when you create a character, practice it, work with it, and make sure you can carry that voice for an hour at a time. An hour at a time. Yes, because if you're in the studio, it's generally two to two and a half hours of recording. And there are breaks, of course, because you may or may not be recording with other actors. It depends on, on how they're putting it together. Um, but you have to carry that voice for a period of time and you have to be able to use that voice over numerous days. Um, the one sort of backside of that and the downside of that is if you're when you're doing video games and all of the punching and hitting and screaming and yelling and all of that. Uh, generally, when we're doing that, that's the last thing we do in the day because your voice is wrecked when you're done and sometimes you can't work for two or three days afterwards because the voice has to relax. So uh, Gollum from Lord of the Rings is one of the mm -hmm. voices I've watched. You and I talked about this before. Yep. Uh, the actor has goo, as he calls it, to keep it yep. salivated and juicy because it's Gollum, Gollum. He's, yep. he's stretching the vocal cord. Even when I do it, it stretches the cords. He did that day after day after day, week after week, month after month, but he came up with his own goo. Do you recommend that people, of course, liquefy it? But what tricks are there to keep that well, voice Well, you, you have to you do have to hydrate. There's no question about it. Uh, how you go about that is, is up to you. I would strongly recommend against alcohol and a lot of caffeine because that tends to dry you out. Uh, I rarely have tea in the studio because the tannin in the tea helps to dry out. I keep water here. Um, fruit juices, if I'm not doing anything too strenuous, but sometimes the sharpness and the acid in the fruit juice can also create a problem over a period of time. Um, Certain foods will help. Green apples help a lot of people. Um, and then, of course, there are the usual um, cough medicines and throat lozenges and, um, you know, all of, all of that stuff. The one thing you want to avoid is the antiseptic, or yeah, antiseptic, no, anesthetic so throat sprays where they numb, they numb the throat or the inside of the mouth because you can damage things without realizing what you've done. And then when it wears off, it's like, oh, crap. Now so I can't I, talk at all. I did that during my sports play-by-play -play -play years. And I did not know that. I, I Because I was doing game after game after game. And I was using one of those thinking, I'm cooling it down. I'm cooling it down. By the third day, I realized, throw that in the trash can. It didn't mean doing to me any good. Yep. Uh, so there are things we should avoid. And we are there are things to help us. Yep. Talk about the physicality. Because the voice actors I know... You, you do the body gestures, you sit up, you stand, you move. As people are thinking about how to leverage their voice better, I encourage them to stand and fully engage. Do you agree that that's the best way to get your voice to perform with you? Well, one of the, one of the differences between acting on stage or on camera and voice acting is, of course, we don't have the vis visual uh, body language, facial expressions, all of that to work with in the vocal booth. You don't pick that up. So it has to be done with a voice. But on the other hand, you still need to be able to move. If you are doing a video game, for instance, and you're running, you're not going to be sitting in the chair. Oh, yeah, I am so tired from running. No, you actually have to physically get up and run. I'm just so bloody tired from running. I can't do this anymore. And, and the whole body is moving and you're getting that action and you're getting the feel of it. Um, voice actors need to know how to act. They need to know how to move. And whether you've had acting training or, or what, you know, you need to be able to do that. Um, if you're going to do a lot of video games, physical activity is great. Any sort of physical activity as a hobby, running or, um, you know, pole vaulting or soccer or football or whatever. Um, just activities that get you out there and get you moving and get the body going. Dancing. Awesome. Anything like that that gets you moving because that will help you create the character. 
I can sit here and I can say, oh, well, okay, I was out running this afternoon and I had a great time and my feet are a little bit sore, but, and then if I'm actually take on the character, I have to put the whole body into it. Oh, crap. I am just exhausted. I was out running all afternoon. Oh, damn, my feet are sore. I've got blisters everywhere. It's the difference in, in, in the performance, but voice acting is storytelling. And that's the difference in storytelling. You can you can get a really bad badly told story, or you can get a really good, uh, well told story that pulls you in. And that's what good audiobooks do. That's what yeah. good e learning does. And and this translates to the virtual stage, to your keynotes on the virtual stage. Mm -hmm. it, everything that Richard is describing here, exactly the same thing. That you need to stand up, do the body gestures, get used to being on this camera. And when you do storytell, put the body into it, put, put the emotion into it. You're not just presenting word, you're presenting like the story. You are trying to pull them in. Your physicality is voice, act, voice acting. You are voice acting, body acting, even on the virtual stage. It's just as important, if not more important, to fully come alive here. Uh, I'm going to share this poll. Let's see what the audience says about their favorite characters here. And uh, number one, Comes out with Speedy the Gonzalez. We got a tie. Two, and Elmer Fudd. Yep. And both Warner Brothers characters, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, which one of this list most attracted you from your days, your early days? Elmer Fudd. Shh, be very quiet. We are hunting rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting enough, is there anyone on here that you thought would have been higher? Uh, well, not not knowing the audience um, that w we're working with tonight, it, it would be very difficult. I would have thought Kenny from South Park would have been higher up for sure, but he got <laughs> zero votes. So Did you do a Kenny? <laughs> I cannot. I those are I I don't I don't cover other characters. I create my own. So so talk us through that process because you are a creator. By the way, he also does costume design. He creates costumes. He's a prop master. He's a producer. You've done a lot of things in the industry, haven't you? Uh, in this industry and others, but my entire life has been creative. Um, everything I've ever done has been creative in one way or another. So that's it's just the way my brain works. Um, a lot of, there are a number of really, really good voice actors out there who can fill in. Uh, for instance, when Mel Blanc died, they had all of those characters to take and, and fill, fill in for voices because they're still using them. And, um, you know, Bugs Bunny has been replaced a few times and Daffy Duck has been replaced. And, and um, the current, I think the current Daffy Duck is actually Canadian. Um, but there's, you know, there's all of that. And they're, those are like cover bands. We have oh, cover yeah. or impersonating voice actors. Um, there are also those who can impersonate celebrity voices. I don't do that. I, my specialty is dialects and characters within the dialects. So, um, well, yes, there, there's those that do the clean version of some movies mm -hmm. and there are voice actors who can do Schwarzenegger, do Bruce Willis, whoever it is, and they will do the clean version of the movie and they will cut and splice the clean made up phrase when the mouth is moving. Uh, yeah. And that's a whole different art to learn how to do that. Yes, that that's that's very, very difficult to do. And a lot of the um, Japanese anime and stuff like that is voiced over. And the voice actor has to has to meet what's called the lip flap. So as the mouth is moving, you have to make the make the words fit. Love this stuff. I again, I, I can geek out on this for a long time. Beverly wants to know: Did you ever do any formal voice preparation training at all, or is this again something you just grew and grew and grew? And if there is formal voice training, what would you recommend for somebody? Uh, for voiceover, you mean? Is that what she's referring yeah, to? I guess. Yeah. yeah oh, whole. there, there are there are literally hundreds of voiceover coaches out there, uh, depending upon what genres you want to work in. Uh, Dave Fenoy is phenomenal in um, in animation. Uh, if you want to do medical narration, there's Julie Williams. If you want to do e-learning, Julie Williams is great. If you want to do kids stuff, 
Um, Lisa Biggs is phenomenal, but there are literally hundreds of voiceover coaches. And yes, I have spent thousands of dollars on coaching and learning this profession. Uh, I had to completely abandon uh, the vocality aspects or the voice production aspects of all of the stage acting and all of the opera singing that I did because I was trained to project in a theater of 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 people without a microphone. And I, can, I used to be able to fill that with my voice. I can do about 2,500 now. Um, I'm a little older than I was back then. Uh, but as a voice actor, the microphone is the ear and the ear is within six inches of your mouth. So if you shout, you're gonna have a problem. Learning how to use the mic is a, is a very important broadcast media yep. presentation tool. You have to learn the distance, the elevation, all those things. Yep. And it, it does protect your voice as well. Yep. Uh, I and, have and, that have blown it out. And if you're, I, I, I've had a number of coaches who started out in broadcasting and who, again, had to change their entire approach to come into voice acting because it's a different um, presentation style. And you, you can't, you bring one to the other. There are a couple of instances where you can bring the, the broadcast into voiceover, but there aren't that many. And voiceover doesn't work as a, as a radio personality because they don't want you to whisper. It was the Falcons that won by 14 points in last night's game. <laughs> <laughs> the only exception with that was Casey Kasem, who yes. did the voice of Scooby and Shaggy. Mm -hmm. So Scoob, an American Top 40, he did radio and many Saturday morning cartoon voices. He yep. was one of the rare that could go back and forth. Well, there, there are still a lot who can, who can go back and forth, but you can't bring the same technique from one to the other. You have to really watch that. Casey Kasem was lucky. He he was able with the characters that he used or he, he portrayed or voiced, uh, he was able to bring his broadcast skills with him. But in a lot of cases, you can't do that. Vivian King wants to know, uh, again, what about daily routine, uh, daily exercises to maintain your voice? Is it daily? Is it weekly? How do you get into a rhythm so you don't do too much or too little? Well, as I say, I start out every every day uh, with a vocal warm up, usually singing. Um, I start out with the usual exercises, vowels and scales and, and vocal eases and all of that. If I know I've got a particularly heavy day in, say, medical narration where I'm going to be or audiobooks where I'm going to be in the studio for four or five hours and I, I don't ever record longer than five hours because the voice is done. Um, I will actually sing an opera aria to wide to open everything wide up. Wow! So, yeah, that um, one's I'm not fortunate. In my routine, by the way, I'm not doing an opera. <laughs> I'm fortunate that I was trained that way. I can do that. Other people have different ways of doing it, but regardless, uh, one of the ways to determine whether or not you want to become a voice actor is to grab a book go sit in a closet on a chair and read to yourself out loud for four hours and do that every day for a week. Wow. And if you can do that, then you want to go to the next step of becoming a voice actor. But if you get claustrophobic or, or your, you know, your voice starts to go or you just can't handle that, then stay away from voice acting because you might get lucky and you might be able to do corporate explainers at, a minute and a half finished, which are about 20 minutes worth of recording and editing, 20 minutes to a half an hour. Um, but if you're doing long form narration or e-learning or medical narration, you can be doing four, five, six hours. Um, you know, medical narration, a medical study, for instance, out of one of the universities in the States can be 140 pages long. Oh, my goodness. And you have to read that. Or you are doing an audio book that is 900 pages or 400 pages or, you know, whatever. We're going to come um, back to audio novels because I have personal yep. experience with that as well. Richard Crossman. And by the way, what's the website? What's the best way to get in touch with you? It's I'm just Richard Crossman, richardcrossman.com or voiceactingmagic.com. Real simple. Don't forget the second half of the show, we are going to let you ask the questions. The camera's on, microphone's on. We're going to bring you on and you can talk directly to Richard. A reminder, this is well, How to Rock the Stage Wednesday night, live every Wednesday from 7 until 8 o'clock. Next week, we will have a special daytime, 1 o'clock Eastern time special. And uh, Stuart Moster will be my guest 
We're going to talk about strategic narratives. And then on the November 16th, back in the evening, at our regular time, Carlton Brunton will be our guest and talk about video content and how to recession-proof your content to keep things going during tough times. Also, thanks to the National Speakers Association for being the sponsor of How to Rock the Stage.